is a it is a great honor um, for me to be here today. Um, I understand these gatherings are only once a month, so I'm like one twelfth of the speakers for this year. So um, I I have incredible um, honor in my heart uh, for Will and Andrea and, and for the TMP leadership team. Um, I really love you guys. I I feel like we are one in the spirit. We want the same thing. We want God to be glorified. Um, in Southern California, but really in all the nations. And um, so today, I do have a burden on my heart. If you have your Bibles, I want to ask that you would open them to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And uh, the name of my message today is The Greatest Treasure. The Greatest Treasure. All right, as we um, get into this portion of Scripture, I just want to set it up a little bit. Um, I heard that you guys have been talking about David for a while, just a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit into David. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with these characters. There's kind of two main characters. Um, well, there's, there's three, but um, as we talk about this, understand Saul is a type. Okay, Saul is a type of person. There is a Saul in all of our hearts. Okay, Saul is given to us as a warning, right? And I don't know about you, but whenever I read about Saul, I can't help but feel a little sorry for the man. And um, I think that's by design. I think that that's how the scripture intended it, that we should feel some sympathy and some compassion um, for Saul because the failures that he has, the mistakes that he makes are very understandable. But he is given to us as a warning and David is given to us as a model, as an example. And I would like to say that there's a part of our hearts, if we know God and we're following him, there's a part of our hearts that's like David also. David's given to us as the example. Saul is given to us as the warning. Saul had failures in his life, but they were understandable failures. They were normal people failures. But he never re really repented of his failures. This was the problem. David had even greater failures. I'm sure you guys are familiar with some of David's greatest failures. He had greater failures, but he had true repentance. He had a heart that was seeking after God's heart. And that's what we're going to look at in 1 Samuel chapter 13. So it says this, starting in verse 1. It says, Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. I'm sorry, I'm in um, verse 7 and 8 there. <laughs> verse 9. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to meet him. What have you done, asked Samuel. And Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer burnt offering. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. Let's pause right there. Brothers and sisters, this is a warning to us. This is a warning to us. If we're careful to keep God's commands and to follow his ways, he will establish us forever. The things that we do, the works that we have will last. I became really interested in this idea of lasting fruit. In John 15, Jesus talks about those who abide in the vine of Christ. And his words abide in them and they have fruit that lasts forever. And I remember I got so convicted by this passage, and I started to meditate on this. I'm like, Lord, what is fruit that lasts forever? And when we look at Jesus' ministry, Jesus ministered for three years, which is incredible. 
and yet his ministry is still bearing fruit today. Jesus' ministry was primarily to 11 people. He spoke to crowds, but many of those turned away from him. His primary ministry was to 11 people, and his ministry touches all of us today. The effect that he had. Jesus is the ultimate example. He had fruit that lasts, and he showed us the way. And you know what? It wasn't because he did so much stuff. If that was the secret, then he should have ministered for 30, 40, 50 years. Such a short amount of time. So few were the things that he did, and yet they had such lasting and deep impact that they still resonate today. David is the same way. David is a model. He's an example. I, I got to tell you, David is my favorite character in the Bible, except for Jesus, because Jesus has to be our favorite, you know. But I love, I love David. I don't understand how anyone else can have a different favorite character in the Bible, right? He's the best, right? He's killing giants, right? He's a man of war, right? He's like an awesome worshiper and a musician, Right? Man, David is, he's the best. I love him. Okay? So in this story, this is, we're primarily looking at Saul here. Okay? Saul, this is, the, this is the idea. Saul is about to go to war, and his enemy is strong. His enemy is big. His enemy is more numerous. And Saul's own army is freaking out. They're like, oh, my gosh. We're going to lose this thing, and I'm going to die. So what starts to happen? Many start to desert him. They start to leave, and Saul's like waiting. He's like, where the heck is Samuel? Where's Samuel? They're leaving. And Saul does something that I think is very understandable. He does something that I think many of us would be tempted to do. He's not careful to obey, and he goes, well, I need God's blessing, so I'm just going to do the offering myself. I'm just going to do it myself. He was told to wait until Samuel would come and do it. But he's like, but the people are running away. And if we don't, if we don't get it now, the people are going to be so scared and we're going to lose this battle. Very understandable. I think many of us, when we read this, we're like, geez, God's kind of harsh. Right? You read this story and this is the sin. This is the final straw. Right? God's like, that's it. You're done. And we look at this and we're like, wow, that's harsh. What the heck, God? Well, I want to tell you why. I want you to understand why. Saul, I think, would have been a pretty good king for every nation. In fact, what we see was that the only reason Saul became king is because the people demanded a king so that they could be like every other nation. So Saul... I think was a pretty normal guy, pretty good guy. The problem was that he was trying to lead the holy nation. He was trying to lead the people that were set apart for God. The problem was not Saul. The problem was that he was out of his depth. He was trying to do an impossible task. He was trying to to lead God's people in God's ways. But the big problem was this, because he didn't know God. This was the problem. He was doing reasonable things, but he didn't really know God's ways. He was doing what he thought would be wise, what he thought would be good. But because he was unfamiliar with the ways of God, he was disqualified. Brothers and sisters, this is so important because look at what Samuel says to him. He says, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has shot out a man after his own heart. Several times we're told in scripture this phrase about David. It's quoted again in Acts 13. Paul says this. About David said, after removing Saul, he made David their king. And God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to. 
This is what we see. In David, God found a treasure. And we have to understand this dynamic. This is so important that we understand this. When God found David, he was not a mighty warrior. When God found David, he was not a great statesman. In fact, he was despised by those around him, his family. He was the runt of the pack. There were likely many slanderous accusations about him growing up. He was not really esteemed by the people around him, and yet God found him. And he said, this is the one. This is the treasure that I have been looking for. And brothers and sisters, I want us to understand this dynamic. God is looking for worshipers. God is looking for worshipers. This is such an important thing to understand. The greatest treasure in heaven and earth is him. He's the greatest treasure. But from God's perspective, the greatest treasure on the earth is a worshiper. I actually have the passage that Andrea was quoting over and over again, right? The eyes of the Lord are searching throughout the earth, seeking whose hearts are wholly devoted to him, right? He's looking everywhere for people whose hearts are wholly devoted. He's looking for worshipers. God is looking everywhere. Why? Because to God, a worshiper is the most valuable thing in the entire earth. That is amazing. And we see it again and again in Scripture. In John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Yet a time is coming, says Jesus, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. The Father's looking for them. He's trying to find them. He's after the worshipers. And my question is, why? Why is that such a big deal to God? Why doesn't he want the people who are the best? Right? The most excellent statesman. The best king. The best warrior. Why doesn't God want the best people at stuff? Because that's what people want. That's what we want. When we dream about what we want to become, it's always about the best, right? I want to be the best guitar player. Right? I want to be the best comedian. I want to be the best. I want to go to Harvard, right? I want to be the best whatever soccer player. We dream of being the best at everything. But to God, being the best at something is garbage. He's like, man, I can do that so much better than you. <laughs> he ain't impressed by your soccer skills, right? He ain't impressed by any of that stuff. This stuff to God doesn't matter, being confident. You know who it matters to? It matters to people. People are impressed because they can't do it. They're like, whoa, that guy's really good. But God's not impressed by any of that. What is he impressed by? He is impressed by a worshipful heart. This is what impresses God. And this is what gives you authority in the kingdom. Authority in the kingdom comes by a worshipful heart. It doesn't come by being the best at everything. It's not the best speaker. Okay? It's not the best worship leader. It's not the best Bible theologian. None of that matters. It's the heart of someone who is wholly devoted to God as manifested through their actions. Because guess what? Every Christian sings songs about how much they love God. Oh, my heart, God, I love you, right? I'll give you everything. No, you won't. Right? I would swim across the sea for you, God. No, you wouldn't. Right? I was thinking about this the other day. You know one of the things that Abraham did? He did a lot of impressive things. But you know one of the things that he did? He got circumcised when he was old. I was just thinking about that that day. I was like, <laughs> man, that one gets no credit, right? Like, geez, I, would, I, would I allow God to? I was thinking about that. I wasn't sure, okay? All of us 
are a lot more impressive in our rhetoric than we are in our actions. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, hear me. I'm not trying to condemn you and make you feel like you, you don't love God at all. Okay? I'm just trying to say we need to have some humility up in here. Okay? Our love for God is demonstrated through our actions. It's manifested through what we do. Right? What we do manifests our love. If you love me, Jesus said, you will obey my commandments. Right? If you love me, you will obey my commandments. So I need to get something clear here. When we're talking about worshipers, I'm not necessarily talking about the ones that sing a lot or sing really good. All right? We have a, we have a pastor at my church. Well, we won't say who he is. All right? He's not a good singer. But he doesn't care at all what you think. Right? He doesn't care at all what you think. It's a sign of being a worshiper. Right? When you're like, oh, I can't sing loud because, man, that person might hear me, that person. It's not a sign of being a worshiper. All right? Okay? Man, we, let me put it to you this way. Why was Saul disqualified? Because he was more concerned with impressing people than he was with impressing God. That's what it was. That's the whole thing. He was a normal person. As a normal person, whoever has the biggest army, the most respect from people, can command the most people, wins. But that's not how it works with God. God is not constrained to save by the many or by the few. God can take a single person and destroy the entire army. That's literally what he did with David. David kills one giant and the whole army's running away. That's how it works with God. God doesn't need a lot of people to accomplish his work. He doesn't really need you. Newsflash. All right. The fate of the world does not depend on you. But he delights to use us. That's crazy, right? He wants to use us. But we have to understand what qualifies us to be used by God. What qualifies us? It's the worshipful heart. This is the thing that binds us to him. This is the thing that he wants. He's looking for those whose hearts are devoted to him so that he can strengthen them. This is a principle that's found all throughout scripture. And brothers and sisters, it's a principle that is just as alive today as it was thousands of years ago. It's just as alive today. George Whitfield, one of the greatest preachers in history, 18th century. You guys ever heard of him? Great Awakening, first one. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of a history lesson here. Okay, George Whitfield, it said he preached, 80% of the colonists in, Amer in the early American colonies heard George Whitfield preach personally. Literally everyone heard him, right? This guy went everywhere. He preached like 10,000 sermons in his life. That's multiple times a day, every day. He's out there preaching constantly, right? He preached a message that all men are created equal. This was revolutionary in the 18th century. He told the poorest coal miners in Britain, he said, if any man is in Christ, then he is a royal priesthood. He is greater than the nobility of England. And they went, oh. It's what's birthed our nation. First Great Awakening birthed the nation of America. The belief that all men are created equal. And the government exists not because God has given the power, but because the people give the power to the government. Brothers and sisters, God used a relatively few amount of people to birth an incredible move that affected the entire earth. Do you understand? That's how he does it. He doesn't need a ton of people. He just needs a small group of wholly devoted, sold out people to work with. That's why I don't care about big prayer meetings. I care about serious prayer meetings. You know how many terrible big prayer meetings I've been in? 
I hate those prayer meetings. I would rather be in a prayer meeting with five people who are going after it with God. Can I just say this? I would rather be in a worship service with five people who just want to meet with God. You know, and I think God, I think God feels the exact same way. I think he feels the exact same way. This is a principle. The greater the concentration of hunger in a room is for God, the more he comes. Right? This is how it works, brothers and sisters. It works. The anointing works because it shows the worshipful heart of a person. Let me put it to you another way. I remember this was like 15 years ago or something. I was visiting Reading. I was at a church called Bethel at the conference there. And this guy was leading words, but I had no idea who he was. This is before, you know, Jesus culture blew up. But man, there was this background singer. Oh my goodness, every time she sang something, it's like the glory of the Lord filled the room. And I was like, get that worship leader off the stage, right? I wasn't seriously saying that, but I was saying, come on, man, let her sing. It's like, let her sing. Because her anointing was so incredible that it was obvious. It was obvious. Every time she sang, the Spirit, the presence of the Lord is filling up the room like crazy. Okay? A couple months later, she blew up on YouTube. That How He Loves Us song. Right? Kim Walker. I didn't know who that, no one knew who the next, she, she was. I went up to her after the service because I was like, I got to meet this girl. I thought about asking her out on a date. But I live like four hours away, so I was like, can I make that work somehow? <laughs> right. It wasn't because her voice was pretty. It's because the anointing on her life was tangible. Does that make sense? Back in the old school vineyard days, the very best singer of all the vineyard worshipers was a guy named Scott Underwood. Now you all know who he is. I am old. This guy had the most glorious voice, right? And then there was this other worship leader. And every time she sang, man, she was all hoarse. She's like off tune all the time, right? But the anointing was so powerful on that lady, right? Her name was Rita Springer, <laughs> right? We sang one of her songs today. This is how it works with songs. The songs that have anointing on them pass the test of time, Right? Every, every, almost every worship song has great lyrics. They're like all equally true. You know what I mean? It's not like that one's more true than that one. Like, like a lot of them are just quoting the Bible, right? What makes a song great? What makes a worship song great? It's not because, you know, oh, wow, this one was really true. No, it's the anointing that's on the song. It's the spirit of worship with which it was written, Amazing Grace was written by a repentant slave trader. He realized the sin that he was in. He realized how terrible it was. He realized that how amazing God's grace was to save a sinner like him. That song is so much anointing. We still sing it today hundreds of years later. It's still powerful. It still touches our hearts. What am I trying to say, church? I'm trying to help us understand how this works. Because look, you have a calling on your life. But your calling is not to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. That's not your calling. There's better doctors than you're going to be. That's not your calling. No. I'm not going to get into a whole message on calling, but I'm going to tell you what the chief calling of your life is. Your calling is to be a worshiper first and foremost. That's the calling of your life. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. This is the number one calling on your life. And if you do it, then you will bear lasting fruit on the earth, and your fruit will continue for eternity. You'll have an impact such that many people will be led to righteousness if you get this right. But can I tell you something? It is very, very, very difficult to get this right. This is something that people do not understand. They don't understand how hard it is 
to have intimacy with Jesus. They think, oh, man, those guys, man, God just blessed them with the gift of intimacy. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. We're all called to be intimate with him. Every single believer is called to be intimate with him. Okay? Every single one is called to be a worshiper. There's no believer that is not called to be a worshiper or called to be intimate with him. We all are. And yet, there's a quote from Francis Chan that I really like. He says this, we often spend a lot of time and effort gathering believers together. We have become experts at gathering Christians around great bands, speakers, and events. Where we have failed is in teaching believers how to be alone with God. Let me put it to you this way. The way I see things, the church exists to create intimate worshipers. What does it mean if we have tons of church meetings, church events, church Bible studies, church seeker fellowships, church bowling tournaments, church everything, and we have so few people that have tangible anointing on their lives? What does that mean? What does it mean when we have Christians who give 10, 15 hours a week to ministry service and yet barely spend time alone in the presence with the Lord. What does it mean? It means something is seriously wrong. That's what it means. It means we have messed something up in a big way. Brothers and sisters, I say this as a pastor. We don't need you to be great greeters. I'm thankful for all my greeters. That's some of you guys are here. Thank you guys so much. All right. All right. But that's not your calling. Okay? We don't need you to be excellent musicians. That's not your calling. We need you to be lovers of God who win the battle for intimacy. That's what we need you to do. It's the most difficult battle in the world. I'm not trying to say it's easy. I'm not trying to say if you just try really hard, you can do it. No, it's really hard. Why? Because you have to deal with everything inside of you that pushes you away from God. You have to deal with the offenses with the shame. You have to deal with the condemnation. You have to deal with the temptations. You have to deal with the feelings of uselessness and restlessness and boredom. You've got to overcome all of those things. But I'm saying this. If you do it, then your life will resound in eternity. If you can do it, then you become a treasure unto the Lord. And that's the calling. This is what we're in. This is the season that the church is in right now. God is destroying a culture of church where it's all about people. Everybody wants the biggest church. Not me. Everybody wants big everything. I just want to be intimate with him. I mean that seriously. I mean, if God says, Dennis, your time as a pastor is done, I'm like, okay, what else? Will I get more intimate with you doing something else? I don't care about that. That's a side thing. All of this stuff is a side thing. What gives me effectiveness as a pastor? Is it because I'm really good at yelling at people? <laughs> kind of. No, that's not what gives me effectiveness as a pastor. What gives me effectiveness as a pastor is because God convicts my heart and I speak my convictions. That's what ministry is. And that's what every Christian is called to do, to get conviction from the Lord. When we connect with his heart in intimacy, he burdens us with his desires. He burdens us with the things that he wants. And then we become ministers. You can't help but become a minister. You're not trying. You're not passing out business cards. 
saying, here I am, Prophet Dennis. Some people are constantly trying to build up their ministries. The insecurity is unbelievable. If you get intimate with God, you will have great ministry. But look, the way great ministry looks, like, it doesn't always look like a lot of people coming to your stuff. Okay, Jesus' primary ministry was to 11 people. So what if God just gives you three people to pour your life into? Oh, God. I wanted to be greatly esteemed by men. That's literally what, you know, how a lot of people feel, right? How about we get rid of all of that and we say, God, I just want to be close to you. He's the portion in this life. Okay, it's intimacy with God. It's having intimate moments with God. What does it mean to love God with all your heart? It means to have a determination. I must have intimate moments with God. And what I'm saying is that you can force yourself into the prayer room. You can force yourself, you know, to have prayer meetings and where your heart never is seeking God. Your heart's never determined. You're just like, you know, trying to get the time over with to fulfill your hour or your 30 minutes or whatever, right? It's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Can I tell you, it's not about the amount of time that you spend trying to seek God. It's, the, it's really the time that your hearts have connected with God, right? It's the tears that you shed in the secret place with the Lord, right? It's the times where you get conviction of these are the times that form you, that give you spiritual authority. And brothers and sisters, this is what God is doing. I believe we are in the greatest prayer movement right now in the history of the church. I think that's where we are right now. I think it's an exciting time to be alive. Why? Because what is the prayer movement? The prayer movement is a call to value God's presence more than man's presence. And God is doing this everywhere. Houses of prayer springing up all over the place because God is speaking this vision to the church why? Because this is the only kind of church that can accomplish his will. This is the only kind of church that can withstand the temptations of these times. That can withstand the persecution of these times. You can't withstand persecution for someone that you're obligated to love. You withstand persecution for somebody that your heart is connected to. And that is the calling in these times, church. God is calling the entire church to stop idolizing everything else. Stop prioritizing everything else and learn to be intimate with them. This is the battle of our lives. Look, it's not a battle that you win, right? Oh, I've arrived. I'm intimate. You don't arrive in this battle. The battle is to prioritize intimacy. And then to keep it there. Sometimes, you know, we prioritize it for like a day. Like you hear a good sermon one night. And you're like, hmm. Tonight, I'm going to prioritize intimacy. And you have one great quiet time. Congratulations. That's a good thing. Okay. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about prioritizing intimacy. Keeping the first thing first for the rest of your life. Right. And that's not easy to do. Have I mentioned that this is not easy? No, it's not easy to do. The number one thing that will kill it, well, there's a lot of things that will kill it. Let me, let me just say a couple, okay? For many of us, look, you have to break off the spirit of shame. You have to declare war against the spirit of shame. For many of us, when we fall into sin, this is how this works, okay? When you fall into sin, you are going to be hit by shame, especially if it's lust, okay? I got to tell you guys, I'm really prophetic. I just feel like a lot of you guys are struggling with lust. It's my prophecy, okay? I'm joking. That's a joke, okay? Let me ask, why is it that so many of us are struggling with lust? Why is it that the enemy has prioritized this temptation, this attack in America. 
Exactly. It's to separate you from confidence in his love. That's what shame does. Shame makes you feel like you don't deserve love. I've fallen. I've given into sin. I've given into temptation. Therefore, I don't deserve God. God probably doesn't want to see me. Newsflash. He knows all about it. Just shut up and repent and go back to him. Okay? Like my kids, man. Sometimes, you know, they do things they're not supposed to do. Like little things, right? Sometimes my oldest son, Judah, yells at his sister, right? I go, Judah, right? And he knows, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. And then you know what he does? <laughs> and he goes and he hides in a corner, right? Or he hides in another room. Or he runs away from me. Why? All this shame, he knows he did something he's not supposed to do. I'm like, Judah, just say you're sorry. And then come here. <laughs> so many of us are like that with God. It's like you know you did something wrong, so now you're just running, and you're still running, and you're still running until Friday night, right? <laughs> you're the greeter at Friday night service, so you have to come, <laughs> right? And then you're finally going to do business with God Friday night, and you've wasted the entire week. Can I say, this is something that was so important for me, getting authority over shame, right? A righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up, all right? Just repent, okay? Don't, don't do, this is what I used to do when I was repenting. I would say, God, I'm so sorry this time. This time, I'm never going to do it again, okay? This time, I'm going to be faithful. This time, I really mean it, right? And I'm like repenting for like 10 minutes, right? Because I have to justify why I deserve to be forgiven, and then what happens? Well, the next time you fall, like, then you really don't want to go back to God because you failed even greater, right? Repent for 10 seconds. This is what the Lord told me, okay? Don't repent for 10 minutes. Repent for 10 seconds, okay? And then get back up and start following him again, okay? Brush off the condemnation. Guess what? God understands you. He understands why you struggle with sin. He really does. Can I tell you why you struggle with lust? Because you want intimacy and you don't know how to get it? So you turn to the perversion of intimacy. You were designed for true intimacy. The only problem is you don't know how to get it. You go, you, get, you go to God. That's how you get it. All right? So repent and get back up and start running. Brothers and sisters, break off the strongholds of shame in your life. But this is what I say. Look, if you're struggling over and over again with pornography and things like this, it could drive the shame really deep. If you have sexual sin or other types of sin that you've never confessed to in your life to somebody else, can I tell you, you really have to confess to somebody. Okay, you have to do it because it's a stronghold of shame in your mind. The enemy will tell you, oh my gosh, if, that, if your pastor knew about that, he would kick you out of the church. Right? If your best friend knew, she would never like you. Right? Oh my gosh, if God really knew, <laughs> God knows, okay. That's how shame works, okay? Shame says, get it right, and then you deserve love. Fix your problem, fix yourself, and then you deserve love. The way God works is come to me just as you are, okay? And I'll make you like me, right? Come just as you are in all of your brokenness, in all your problems. You don't know why you're so broken. He does come just as you are. But I say this, if there are strongholds, it really helps to break this if you cut off the things that God tells you to cut off, all right? I've been telling my kids, you guys are probably getting sick of it, but I think we need a flip phone revolution up in here. I think, I think this is a strategy of the Lord, okay? Divine strategy. Just get rid of your smartphone, right? Why not? This is what you do. How do you have intimacy? How do you have intimacy? You build him an altar with your life. You build him an altar with your life. You throw the things that are hindering love on the altar, and it becomes a sacrifice, and your life is empty now for him. Okay? Many of the people that I know that have developed great anointing in their life, what they've done is they have emptied their lives of everything that was a stumbling block to them. Okay, when I was in college, I went six years, I did not play video games by myself. 
Six years, the Lord told me, cut that out. I gave it up just to obey him. All right. When I was in college, my sophomore, junior years in college, I had no internet. Didn't need that. Stupid internet. All right. Why? Because I needed intimacy. That's what I needed. That's what I needed. I needed to be close to him. I tell my kids, I had, my room was literally, I had a desktop computer <laughs> without internet. <laughs> no games on it. It literally had Microsoft Word, right? And it had a, a, an, an application called Winamp, right? Which was an old music player, all right? And it was sitting on the floor because I didn't have a desk. And I had a mattress and I had a bunch of clothes and I had a guitar. That was it. That was my life, my sophomore year of college. And you know what I did? Because I got rid of everything that distracted me from spending time with him. And I was like, I'm determined to be close to God. I want it more than anything else in my life. Nothing is more important to me than being close to God. And what I had to destroy, the enemy that I had to beat in that season was boredom. Can I just say this generation is powerless against boredom? This generation is getting its butt kicked. This generation of Christians, I mean, it just does not know how to sit still. Just sit there. Oh, you get itchy, like your fingers, like, oh, the phone, the apps, right? Just sit there, learn to sit there, learn to be still. Do you understand you can one of the main things that keeps you from being able to encounter God is time consciousness. Time consciousness. Because you're, so, you're thinking about all the other things that you have to do, all the other priorities that you have, right? All the other important things about life. News flash. None of them are more important than meeting with God. I'm serious. None of them are more important than meeting with God. It's the most important thing. If you do it a lot, you will be great in eternity. Boy, that's a good deal. If you don't do it, you will get a little bit of fun with Instagram, Candy Crush, right? You will enjoy the fleeting pleasures of this life and you will forfeit great spiritual authority. That is the, that's the worst bargain ever, but that's the bargain that the vast majority of Christians are making today. Right? We're making it because we don't have a vision. We don't have a vision for intimacy that requires the cost of our lives. When Jesus said, if anyone would be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I say, if you're struggling with pornography, you should consider getting rid of your computer, your internet, whatever it might be. And you know what I hear in my mind? Jesus, I will give you my life but I won't give you my smartphone. And I'm like, you just don't realize that you have to do these things. You have to do these things, right? People, Christians think it's optional. But no, if you want to be great in his kingdom, right, then you've got to get intimacy. That's what I'm talking about. It's a war. Do you understand? It's a war for your destiny. You are in a war for your destiny if you get into your destiny, then God will place you in the picture of what he's doing in the nations. But the vast majority of Christians today have settled for just having God make them a little bit happier. They've got eternal life. Now, all those things are wonderful and great. I'm not trying to diminish any of that. But I'm trying to say, do you understand what Paul means when he says, I beg you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received? What the scriptures mean when it says many are called, but few are chosen. When Paul prays, oh, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened to know the hope of his calling. Why did Paul live in the way that he did? Why did he subject himself to torture, to shipwreck, to beatings, to starvation? Why? Because I want to know you. I want to know you, God. I want to know you. I want to fellowship in your life. And he understood that. Man, he had to fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. Hear me. This is the calling. 
if we will trust him, trust him, believe that intimacy with God is truly better than anything that the world could provide, then it must happen in our actions. There's no other way. Our guest speaker for our last retreat, his name was Chris Scoes. He shared his testimony about how he, he got rid of everything in his room. He didn't have anywhere to pray. So he made his room the prayer closet. He literally got rid of everything out of his room. He just got rid of it all. He's like, this is going to be my prayer closet. I hear those testimonies all the time from people who are serious about being intimate with God. They do whatever it takes. They cut off whatever needs to be cut off. They change whatever they need to change. Because they have a dream in their hearts. And brothers and sisters, this is what I'm telling you. You have that opportunity too. You have the opportunity to embrace the calling of being a worshiper. God found David a treasure. Where did he find him? In the fields, taking care of the sheep. In that place, David found God. He found him. He didn't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. There was no temple then. He didn't have to go to the local gathering of Jewish believers, right? He didn't have to go somewhere. He found God in the fields. He didn't realize that he had passed the test. He passed a test he didn't know he was taking. God found him a man who's after his own heart. Brothers and sisters, I call you in the name of Jesus. I call you to be unlike every other generation. I call you. To be the bride of Christ. This is the calling of this generation. Those who have prepared themselves, made themselves ready. Who have cast off every other love and saying, God, I am determined to be close to you. Whatever it takes, I'm willing to sacrifice everything else for this one thing. That's why David was able to say one thing I desire of the Lord and that also shall I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze upon his beauty. Build an altar in your life, church. Come on. How about some real Christians up in here? How about the Christians who are serious when they say, Jesus, I will give you everything. I trust you like that. Why? Because these are the Christians that we need in this generation. That God would pour out his spirit on this generation And we would see a harvest unlike any that we've ever seen in the history of the world. God is making a call to consecration. This is how it always works. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, the Lord says, he will do wonders among you. But we have to consecrate ourselves. That's what the prayer movement is all about. It's consecrating ourselves. By God's grace, he's given us a strategy to create houses of prayer, spaces where people can come and seek the Lord for intimacy. I understand sometimes we live with our parents and say, I don't know, I don't, I don't have nowhere to pray, right? Like every time I pray, my mom is like banging on the door. Well, thank God, God is raising up spaces for the church to give themselves, to commit to it. I say, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's take the call to be intimate with God seriously. Let's make it the first thing in our hearts. Let's say, God, if I don't have anything else, this is the one thing I want. I want to be close to you. I want to learn to hear your voice, God. Hear me, it's not going to happen in a day. You're going to have times where you're like, man, this is impossible. Do you know what happens when you have those times? When people don't understand, they get frustrated when they can't do things in their own strength. But you understand the whole secret of Christianity is that when you reach the end of your strength, you call upon greater grace from the Lord. It's in your weakness and strength is made perfect. It's when you're like, God, I don't know how to be closer to you. God, I must have it though. Your humility, your hunger, your drive calls down a greater grace from God. That's how you do it. It's not about you disciplining yourself so well. Discipline is a part of this. But no, what you really need is for God to pour out a grace upon you. Pour out revelation upon you. Pour out a worshipful spirit upon you. You need him to actually do something in your life. That's what Christianity is about. 
When I was a senior in high school, I got convicted. I got convicted. I was in a time of repentance. Everybody was repenting. And some people were crying. I remember this one girl, the snot was like running down her nose. And I don't know about you, but for me, when I was in high school, I never felt like God did anything with me. Like sometimes I went to one of the churches where everybody like falling, right? Some people were like shaking really weird, right? And I was like, I didn't get it. I was in this service though, and everybody's repenting, and I can see they're sorry for their sins. And I start to I start to really try to repent. You ever try and do that? God! So sorry! Right? So sinful! Right? But this thought came to me and it said, but Dennis, you're gonna do the same thing next week. I was like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Right. I was trying so hard to repent. And this guy, I don't know who he was. Maybe he was an angel. He came to me and said, can I pray for you? And I said, yeah. And I told him what was going on. And he looked at me and he's like, hmm. He said, the problem is you have a self-sufficient Christianity. And I was like, what did you just say to me? <laughs> I didn't even know what he meant. It just sounded bad. I was so disturbed by this, and I was like, I'm not going to change. I don't have the ability to change. I don't know. I'm, I know I'm going to commit the same sins next week, and I don't know how to change. And so that night, I, I, I made a decision. I'm going to go up on the mountain. I went up on, this is at Akilawana Prayer Mountain, went up on the mountain. It's all scary up there. But I determined I was not going to come down until I felt remorse for my sin, right? I was going to get remorse, right? And I was up on the mountain crying out to God, and I got one of my very first visions ever. It wasn't impressive, okay? This was the vision. God was up there, and he just looked at me, and he just crossed his arms like that. And when I saw it, I knew exactly what it meant. I knew what it meant. It meant that he had to reach down and touch me and give me remorse, but he was like, I'm not going to do it. And I was like, oh. I was like, this is not how this is supposed to work. <laughs> right? Like, he's supposed to do it. Right? I pray, you answer. Right? I remember I went, I went home that night. I went down the mountain. And I realized something. I had a self-sufficient Christianity. My understanding of Christianity was all about how I would discipline myself more and work harder and study scripture more be more obedient, and I realized I actually need God to change me. He actually has to touch me, and if he doesn't, I'm screwed. I can't grow. I'm going to be stuck here forever. The reason why I share this testimony is because I want you to understand. I'm not saying that you have to work so hard that you force God to be intimate with you. Not possible you can't force him to be intimate with you but what you could do is you could position yourself and show him how important it is to your heart and can I tell you it moves him God is moved by the heart that is longing for him he's moved by it but can I also tell you what he's what he does he often does not do exactly what we want him to. Most of the time, he doesn't do what we expect him to because he's God. He challenges our hearts in ways that we don't realize we needed it to be challenged. He forces us to at, grapple with the question, God, why aren't you doing what I'm expecting you to do right now? The way it works is like this in the kingdom. The kingdom works through a principle called resurrection. It's only often after your hope has died that God is ready to move. I hate it. I hate that sometimes. But brothers and sisters, that's how it works. For some of you, you had a dream of intimacy once, but you let it die. I want to love you and say, 
Would you ask God to raise it from the dead? That's how it works. This is what he delights to do, because you know why? He wants to show us that it's not by might and it's not by power. It's not to the most disciplined. It's not to the best behaved. It's not to the person who knows the scriptures the best. It's to the one who puts their trust in him, hoping beyond hope. And God delights to move and show himself strong. And I want to speak to some of you, because this is what I see. For some of you, you have had this dream of intimacy in your heart, but you didn't allow God to circumcise you in the way that he wanted to. For some of you, God was asking for different things in your life, and you weren't willing, and so he had to bring you a roundabout way through discipline. Okay? This happens to us sometimes. That's okay. Suck it up. Discipline is part of this thing. Okay? Let God be God. But you renew the hope that you can have that which you beat on the door again and again for. I'm going to close with this. Worship team, could you come up? Think about how God, Jesus, taught us to pray. He said that we should pray like a man who's desperate for food. His neighbor comes in the middle of the night. He goes to his neighbor's house. He knocks on the door of his neighbor. He says, neighbor, I need food. And what happens? The neighbor's like, get out of here. How dare you come to my door in the middle of the night? I'm with my kids. Brothers and sisters, it's weird, but God likes us to be presumptuous about this stuff. He likes it. When we go, God, I must have intimacy. And God's like, uh, maybe not right now, or I'm not going to move. And I'm like, no, I must have it, God. I'm going to knock on your door every single day. I know I can't force the door down, but God, I am going to bug the heck out of you. right? I'm going to give you no rest, God. I am going to storm the doors of heaven. That's what our prayer life should be like sometimes. right? I've had those times where it seems like the gates of heaven are shut. You're knocking, you're knocking, nothing's happening. Oh, I just come back tomorrow. <laughs> Sometimes I give up. But I come back tomorrow, right? And if I don't break through, then I come back tomorrow. I come back the next day because this is the dream of my life. This is what I've given everything for. Church, let's stand up right now. I'm not preaching an impossible thing. I'm preaching what I think the Lord is speaking to the church right now. God is pouring out grace for intimacy in much greater measure than the earth has ever experienced. This is going to be an entire generation of those who give their lives away because of their love for him. Because they've fallen in love with him. This is going to be the generation that did, does not get moved from the place of intimacy. The bane of the church has been to start movements, birth out of intimacy, and then to drift from that intimacy. To lose their anointing. To lose their power. But this is the generation where God is establishing the priority of the presence. And it's something we won't ever move on from. We're going to give our lives to stay in the presence of the Lord for the rest of our lives until he comes again. And I want to say, if this is a dream of your heart, and you say, God, I want this. this is, I want this to be the number one thing in my life. More important than anything else, I want to make the calling of a worshiper to be the first thing in my heart. I want to invite you to come to the front right now because we're going to pray for an anointing to come upon you. You are saying, God, I am willing. Shake everything that can be shaken. I want it, God, whatever it takes. I don't know what you'll ask for, but I do say I want this more than anything else. This is the dream that I have to be close to you forever. Let's bring our hearts before the Lord right now as we worship.